Buenos dias, bon dias, hello everyone, um, and welcome to our webinar, Boosting Efficiency to Deliver Affordability, Security, and Jobs in Latin America. I'm Edith Bayer, and um, we're very happy to have you here with us today. Before we start, I'd just like to uh, show a couple of housekeeping slides. So the webinar today has simultaneous interpretation between English, Spanish, and Portuguese. So to select your preferred language, please just click on the interpretation button at the bottom on the, on the bar at the bottom of your screen, and you can click the language you'd like to hear. If you're trilingual, you can just click off and you'll hear everything in the original. Um, and please share your questions and comments with us in the chat box. Um, you can enter your questions in whichever language you prefer. We should be able to, to handle them. And at the end of the panel discussion, there'll be a little bit of time for questions and answers, and we'll take a few questions from the audience. So with that, I would like to pass the microphone over to Brian Motherway, Head of Energy Efficiency at the International Energy Agency. Brian, the floor is yours. Thank you, Edith, and good morning, everyone. Buenos dias, buenos dias. It's a pleasure to have you all with us today. Uh, we see many people joining us, so we're delighted to have so many friends and colleagues from across the Latin America region and, of course, beyond. We're delighted to be working uh, on these issues with all of our friends and colleagues in Latin America. Uh, we say good morning to you all, and we're looking forward to the discussion we're going to have today about really key issues in terms of how clean energy policies, particularly energy efficiency policies, can make people's lives better, and how they are already making people's lives better and have been doing so for a long time. Uh, and Edith and her team have been studying this in more detail, uh, and you'll hear about that shortly, as well as hearing from many key experts working in the region and I want to thank all of our speakers uh, who are joining us here today for this discussion. Why are we looking at the social benefits of energy efficiency? First of all, we all know that it's important to continue to make the case for stronger energy efficiency policies. We know that sometimes in energy policy debates and even in clean energy policy debates, we tend to focus on supply side issues. We tend to focus on different types of investment about where we get our energy from. And sometimes we neglect to focus on how energy is used in terms of making it more efficient, more affordable for people. And if we can remind policymakers and all stakeholders about the wider benefits of energy efficiency, relating to job creation, relating to making energy more affordable, making people's lives more comfortable, more healthy, more productive, making industry more competitive, making energy systems more secure. All of these benefits can remind us why we need to keep this strong focus on energy efficiency. And anyone who follows the IEA's work will know that we, we call energy efficiency the first fuel. We focus in all our analysis on how we need to lead with stronger action on energy efficiency. And the discussion we're going to have today is going to remind us of why that's really important. Secondly, though, it's also important to look at how policy design can actually maximize these benefits. They're not just incidental, but better policy design will make sure that people benefit to the maximum from job creation, from energy bill reduction, from wealth enhancement, from economic development, not just as a whole, but in distributional terms as well, so that we can learn from policymakers who have successfully designed policies that make sure that women benefit adequately, that more marginalized or poor communities communities benefit and that there's a fair distribution of the outcomes as well, of course, as of, as of the costs. So it's really important to analyze what has, ha what has happened so that the new policies that are designed uh, will be even better and that will bring the most benefit to people and particularly to the people who need it most. And it turns out, as you'll see this morning, that there really are huge benefits from energy efficiency. It really brings many multiple gains in terms of making people's lives better. It creates jobs, it creates local jobs, it creates skilled and less skilled jobs, it cre creates jobs in the construction sector, in retail, in manufacturing. It also makes energy bills lower. It really enhances the concept of access to energy so that it's access to affordable energy so more people can be cool in hot places, can be warm in cold places, uh, that can make their lives better, they can become more mobile, they can access better education and jobs, and you'll see examples of all of these things. It takes good design, and you'll hear that from colleagues speaking throughout this webinar, that good design can maximize these benefits, and it reminds us 
why we are doing these policies. These are not technical issues. These are social issues. We are designing policies to make people's lives better, to mitigate the worst effects of climate change, but also to enhance social and economic development, uh, to eliminate poverty and inequality, and energy efficiency has a key role to play across the board there. So there's lots to learn from the region. There's lots to learn within the region. We're going to learn from each other today. We're also going to, some of, some of our guests joining us from different parts of the world are going to see the great work going on in the region. Uh, but we're also, our job here at the IEA is to help countries, policymakers, individuals all around the world learn from each other. And today's event is part of a series of events where we're focusing on some of the people and social aspects of clean energy and encouraging people right around the world to engage in these discussions learn from each other and that's exactly what we are doing today. Um, we will also be talking about some of the work that's coming up from the IEA in the region. We want to thank all of our partners in the region. We're working currently on some new market analysis so we can see exactly what's happening in terms of energy use devices. What are people buying? How are they using them? How is that affecting questions around affordability and access? All of this really important questions. And of course, many of you joining us today will also know that, that our colleagues in the World Energy Outlook team are currently producing a firm First special, first ever focused regional report, World Energy Outlook, looking at Latin America that will come out later in the year. And of course, we'll touch on all of these questions. So today's discussion couldn't be more timely and pertinent in that regard. So I'm really looking forward to hearing all of the discussions. I want to thank all of you for joining us, particularly our speakers, but I particularly want to thank my colleagues, Anna and Edith, who will be looking after you throughout today's webinar. And with that, I wish the discussions well and hand back to you, Edith. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, uh, for that introduction. And um, I'm, I'm now going to switch to Spanish. Sorry, I don't speak Portuguese, uh, pero voy a, voy a presentar en español. Um, eh, me llamo Edith I'm Bayer. going to introduce in Spanish. I'm Edith Bayer. I'm an analyst for um, in International Energy Agency. And well, I'm going to present some of the con main conclusions of the um, report that we just published a few weeks ago. Uh, about energy efficiency to um, ensure security, affordability, and jobs in the Latin American region. So the first thing I would like to mention about the um, report approach, this um, report approaches all these policy programs of energy efficiency in the region that has moved into the following subjects. These four um, topics, noticing that energy efficiency includes other benefits. So the topics in which we um, join its um, affordability access and savings, especially in um, homes, saving in public uh, budgets, both nationally and subnational and states and municipalities, energy uh, security in the short as a response to critical situation in the long term and short run, I will give an uh, example and also security in the long run. Eventually, we will uh, speak about the employment uh, that we have and what uh, clean energy are creating, but also th thinking about the future careers and also about the jobs that are being developed starting from these days. Now, which will be the objectives of this analysis or the goals? First, we would like to strengthen the um, understanding of how energy efficient is supporting politic uh, priorities. As many of us know, energy efficiency is a transversal topic that includes a number of um, topics and a number of um, important things, not just energy, but um, socially and environmental aspects. So what we wanted to do was to research within the region where is energy efficiency supporting this politic uh, priorities and to then go to the second point right here to increase the communication of those experiences. Also through research, we have developed some recommendation based on the experiences that we have seen and also the potentials that we notice that are here uh, to develop. Some 
uh, words about the process. Well, this report is a bit different from others of the reports that the agency uh, publishes, that it does not represent the results of the modeling, but it's like the result of this research of a number of um, dialogues with governments, ministries, agencies, and some uh, other stakeholders within the region to understand the results that um, the energy efficient is bringing both for public policies and a number of programs in the region. So then we based on official data, for instance, in Brazil and Mexico, where we have this range of uh, data, which is quite complex, then we based on the um, focus of composition that gives us some uh, macro results to call it something. And also we based on a number of reports about the uh, improvements of the public policies and reports about projects and uh, programs. And also I would like to highlight that um, um, this report is based on these findings. As we know, we cannot present what has not been measured. So right now we actually started the um, focus on what we have measured to show the benefits that have actually been accomplished that we can show as examples of how through energy efficiency, we can improve some of the priorities, politic um, priorities and some priorities in which we are based in this report in today's discussion. Now, I will present some of the examples of this report, but also I would like to explain that there's a number of, of um, more um, examples within the report and there's with um, bibliography in, in presented by country that shows all these examples through uh, links with more information. Some of the examples that were shown uh, within this report. So there's a lot more information within this uh, publication and we invite you to visit it in our website. So on um, accessibility and access. Well, the first example comes from Mexico, which is a very interesting um, program which shows the correlation between the over three decades of a minimum um, Mexican standards. And during this time, the increase of access to uh, refrigerators and washing machines in the country that has increased 20% in this period of time. And also we use that the um, average use has reduced 17%. So there's two messages which are relevant in here. The first one is access. Sometimes when we talk about energy and efficiency, we talk about savings in comparison to the level of use that we can see right now. And in this example, we also uh, talk about like the first access for households that before didn't have every refrigerator or uh, washing machines. Now they do have it with uh, this um, expense, uh, which is lower than what you would see with the minimum standards that promote a marketplace with um, uh, electric uh, household appliances. And also we see that the reduction on this average uh, use of electricity is uh, shown thanks to this um, program, so changing of uh, equipment. So there's a number of things that are really moving, but we see a very relevant um, role of this minimum um, programs that promote more efficient uh, devices. And then we see the uh, increase of access through these services. And eventually we have some refrigerators because refrigeration is needed. Washing machines to have clean clothes. So these are very important services and fundamental. And also we see that there is this benefit in terms of the average use, which is lower. That also means lower uh, bills to pay for the households. The second example comes from Brazil from the energy efficiency program, which is this program um, supported by distributor um, electric distribution companies in the country. Most of the programs that have been implemented, and for sure we will uh, listen more about this program in this discussion, it has been accomplished in low income households. This project has um, saved um, an important amount of energy, 30 kilowatts per hour, which represents about 50% of the mean um, 
use of electricity in households with low income. So it's an important uh, reduction. And the third example here is the one from Chile that has implemented these uh, subsidy programs for the um, isolation of uh, vulnerable existing households. And the first thing that we want to mention here that we have to reach a very important number of families that benefit from this um, program. We see over 33 uh, families benefit from this, 33,000 families benefited from this. And then when my boss mentioned, Brian Motherway, this program come to reach this uh, minimal thermical standard, which is uh, through this uh, standards, uh, new standards in household. And as this is based on low income families, and vulnerable families also ensures that these families would benefit from the public policies that exist in the country to improve the um, household efficiency and also it returns in lower um, bills for them to pay for heating and and cooling of spaces now when we talk about public budget also we see a number of examples of how uh, energy efficiency programs have saved on public budget. Another example from Mexico, where energy efficiency program in the federal public management has uh, performed in the last 10 years, an important saving through energy efficiency um, measurements in um, buildings and um, vehicle fleets. This program exists for over way over 10 years, uh, but this um, data comes from this analysis of the last 10 years. Another example, which is different, but also very interesting, is this example of this municipality, the city in Guarulhos in Brazil, that has implemented, has had this um, comprehensive approach, seven actions, among them has focused on public um, lighting and in hospitals, uh, solar water heating in social public um, households and the uh, supply of municipal water. And this uh, saving, which is um, important, relevant of energy, they recovered the expenses in about five years. So we have two examples of public transportation. There's a number of examples in the region of um, changes towards electrification of uh, some buses in the cities. And well, right here, we have this example of Santiago de Chile, where we see that energy costs for electric um, buses, it has reduced 65% lower than diesel ones, and it goes to a lower um, maintenance cost. And in Uruguay, a different um, example, the analysis, which is also very interesting, where 4% of the um, buses uh, fleet has been replaced from diesel to electric, which is very interesting. This is an example of orienting public support towards some alternatives lowering carbon. So the support in here, it's uh, equivalent to the subsidy for fuel that is paid for during the um, entire lifespan of um, diesel bus and now it's giving into a low carbon which is the electric buses uh, uruguay has a really large um, decarbonized fleet now when we talk about energy security well you see this example from brazil which is this example i would say the largest one right now in the region that has this um, energy crisis and heat breaking very important in 2021 that needed some measurements along to the demand to take care of some um, more serious uh, issues in the um, in the country and to avoid some more uh, more expensive costs so two examples is a reduction of the use of energy in households mainly through some incentives and prices and information campaigns and also we see the leadership of this uh, public sector, uh, federal uh, buildings receive the mandate to reduce their use and they reduce their demand in 21% during this uh, key months of this crisis. Also, it's quite important to see the energy efficiency um, policies 
in the context of energy security in the long run. Three examples. One of the importance of standards for electric devices in Brazil, that it um, they expect to generate a very important saving from 2019 to 2030 in Uruguay. We have an example programmatic, which is the national program of lighting that saved about the 1% of the total electric use in the entire country. So you can imagine that this represents a cost of generation and distribution and transmission of electricity, which was avoided. And if, uh, lastly, in Brazil, the energy efficiency program that I've mentioned along to the Purcell program, which is the other main program of energy efficiency in the country, that both have saved over 12,000 gigawatt an hour of electricity in the last decade, which uh, represents 82% of the total energy efficient, um, energy solar photovoltaic uh, energy in 2021. So this shows um, this energy benefit in terms of the electric system. And lastly, also, we spoke about employments and careers or jobs and careers for the future. So in here, we can see that according to the report of the agency on jobs and globally, the energy efficient represents almost 11 million of uh, positions in uh, Latin America. They direct jobs related to energy efficient represent about 8% of the in, uh, jobs in the energy sector, which is a relevant um, amount. Also, it's important to mention that most of these employments are based in the uh, construction and manufacture industries. There is very interesting report from the International um, Employment Agency now talking about these future careers, and it's talking about the decarbonization that includes a, a strong component of energy efficiency, which a potential of 50 million jobs in Latin America and the Caribbean by 2030. Many of them in this uh, main construction and manufacture industry or sectors. And in here, this is an area of research which is really relevant. And also, um, for starting from this public policy standpoint of view, uh, which includes many opportunities, some of them some of the areas right here, but not all of them, like the accreditation of green, um, green buildings, like green um, Casa Verde, that created new opportunities of employment, um, energy management and the industry and buildings, and also digital technologies that give us a more um, availability of information and a better um, possibility of flexibilize uh, demand and to build an electric uh, system which is more flexible and more renewable. Lastly, we have some recommendation. I would say that this recommendation are wide, but important. First, we acknowledge that there are some structures of public policies of governance to accelerate and to perform um, energy efficiency in a number of countries in the region. So the recommendation is that there's this opportunity to strengthen these structures to accelerate and, and increase um, energy savings. And also in the report, there's some numbers about the um, potentials that we have found and exist to yet to be performed. Also, it's important to focus ourselves in the opportunities to create uh, some policies which are innovative. And this could include some topics like, like how to um, go beyond the gap into um, energy efficiency with the use of energy efficiency programs being this link between efficiency and accessibility, affordability, and also to develop some uh, training programs, which is a really important um, aspect if we talk about future careers. And lastly, but less important, we have this major opportunity to develop public policies that could actually um, perform the flexibility of the use of energy with the use of digital uh, technologies. That is a topic that the agency is working with a lot of detail. And well, like a conclusion, which is quite important, 
is um, how relevant data are to continue and continue the public policies and the programs. And well, uh, many times this information is lacking. We actually struggle in finding this information. Uh, the employment, for instance, they're this sector where they um, there's a lot of information missing. And uh, this is an area where we see a lot of benefit to yet to develop and um, a little bit more space to do these benefits on energy efficiency to communicate them better and to link them to other priorities of the governments in the region. So with this, thank you very much for your attention. I um, We invite you to watch the, to take a look to this report, and then I'll give my word to Anna Lepore, which is a consultant for the agent, international agency agency in Mexico and in Mexico and people that are way more important because they are actually uh, the ones that are accountable for this program that we present in this program. So Anna, please take the floor. Thank you very much for this introduction, Edith. We are so um, humbled and thankful today to have three major experts of two countries that um, Edith already mentioned as Brazil and Uruguay as uh, well as the uh, regional, which is like the Inter-American Development Bank. I welcome and I thank everyone that are uh, linked in. I welcome uh, Carmen Silva Sanchez. She is in charge of the Energy Efficiency Program of the National Energy Agency in Brazil. Also, we have Carolina Mena, and she is the manager of Energy Efficiency of the Ministry of Industry and Energy from Uruguay. Thank you very much, Carol. And also we have Jose Antonio Ortega, which is a senior expert of energy efficiency in the Inter-American Development Bank. Thank you very much to the four of you for being here with us. We have prepared some questions, especially to go deeper into this that this showed about the relevance of how the governments and how the citizens can actually use energy efficiency for the transitions that we have in the region. So I would like to be able uh, to start with Garmin. Garmin, most welcome. If it was uh, mentioning about the energy efficiency programs, it's uh, going to celebrate 20 years of implementation. And we know that uh, very soon they will um, publish this report of everything that they have accomplished in this two decades. Could you please share a bit which are like some of the main conclusions or contributions that you have as a result of this analysis and how this has contributed this program from the energy efficiency perspective? Yes, of course. Good morning, bon dia. I will be speaking in Portuguese. So I have all uh, the main uh, programs and um, so I'm so thankful to give some information of the energy efficiency program and so yes, I also have uh, the opportunity like the implementation of the program. So some of the program that has happened. We identify the need and the opportunity to make this assessment of what has happened in the last two, 20 years. And then, well, for sure, 20 years is uh, quite a period, right, of commemoration. If we remember from the implementation of PE, well, over 5,000 projects has been accomplished. And we'll ha we have investments in the uh, over $20 million, and dollars, so it's $604 uh, million of reals. And we have some energy results which are very significant, many meaningful, like the report of a low income and other results, right? But the assessment being the more systematic um, assessment, well, 
to have this um, information and gathering of the information of the program, to have this memoir, to have the knowledge such that uh, all this could be synthesized, analyzed, and presented, providing some recommendation of perfectioning or improvement to every improvement we have this study. But in fact, we have to make this a more um, vast uh, study. And this opportunity will have the opportunity to watch the direct and indirect effects in which we are looking right now in the current phase of the project. This project is being executed by the Tully Vargas um, institution, a real, very reputable institution with a major funding of um, GCA uh, German agency. So we are using this methodology, which is consolidated, that it's based in a document from the Brazilian federal government, which is assessment of public policies, and practical guide of analysis. So based on that methodology, um, this was divided in three aspects, actually four aspects, because we have right now um, uh, the last one, which includes low income, but the assessment allow us to make a, a vast and executive um, assessment of the whole program, assessment of the results, and the assessment of the impact on the low income projects that has a very significant participation. And well, this has actually happened. The result on this um, participation well allows us that we, based on evidence, with this um, solid methodology, which is the um, efficiency and perfectioning that is feasible for the BE to um, meet its goal at the end of the project, then we pretend to assess or to test a logical model that would be identified for the program. And it's practically an hypothesis which we, we work if the um, electric energy distribution invests in projects dedicated to energy efficiency, then there will be uh, some savings of the use of energy and the um, we will reduce the um, demand in the peak uh, period, which are evidence that we already monitored since the beginning of the program. But also those investments have into the possibility of the energy efficiency uh, program, the sustainability of the market of energy efficiency and generation of new jobs and the reduction of greenhouse effect gases. So these are indirect effects that we are um, putting together in the project. That's why we want to show those results that have been foreseen for this year. But yet in this two, um, second semester, we still have uh, some important direct relevance like indicators of uh, economical indicators that include the structures of the program. We have some of the regions that received uh, the program and uh, equipments and um, energy indicators, like some indirect effects, as I mentioned in the hypothesis itself and the logical model. We want to present the impact on the program and the executor's um, companies. And also with the companies, given that the companies were generated and there's um, associated with their maintenance in their marketplace to the program, to the equipment marketplace and everything that the program promotes within the um, growth of the air conditioning, equipment, refrigerators, etc., and also the um, jobs marketplace and the um, qualification of these jobs, especially in the executors um, companies that provide services to the executors and the distributors of energy to implement these projects of the PE. In the second semester, then, we have this agenda along with the International Energy Agency, and we will um, disclose this result in a very wide manner for all our audience. So this is the main topic in our project of assessment of the program. And well, um, finishing with energy security, well, 
we have identified uh, the PE plays a major role on energy security of the country in the short and long run. In the short run, well, we have already identified that the PE has reduced 0.5 the uh, use of energy used in Brazil based on um, data from 2017, for instance, the use in the country in 2022 was 67 um, gigawatts as an average that re it's a representative va value, of course, to promote and ensure uh, the service to the um, Brazilian marketplace. And also uh, with some actions, we have some specifics of BE that are for the long run, which are educative uh, processes and awareness programs. And we look for some investments in the behavior of the consumer through uh, awareness and education. This is uh, some of the roles of the PE in terms of energy security. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carmen. Actually, right now, we are even more eager to see the results of that report because, indeed, there's a number of things that you're mentioning where the countries around Latin America would like to have some more information of how um, the programs could be implemented. So this energy efficiency topic, well, it's something crucial in the moment. So I have right now some questions about to move on. And if you um, are okay, well, I will have a round of questions and then I will go back to ask you some things, especially about the numbers of and in funding that was assigned to the program. If I can, I will go to Carolina. Hola, Caro, gracias. Hello, good morning, thank you. Good morning to everyone and good afternoon to those in, in which is afternoon for you. And well, thank you very much for uh, your invitation to share the Uruguay's experience and also to listen to Brazil's experience, which is so interesting. And that shows everything that we have before us, a number of countries, yes. Thank you very much, Carolina. Well, and also we want to hear from you. Actually, the Uruguay case is so interesting. Well, all the cases that are within this report, there's a lot of information with this work that has happened in the some years, some examples that from the last years with mother, more recent, the Uruguay case, it's a world leader of uh, energy, um, eolic energy into the um, energy matrix. So if we would know what's the role that energy efficient has played to move forward in this energy transition in Uruguay. Yes, great, Anna. As you know, uh, you may have heard in some other places where the guy shows its case. In 2018, there was this uh, situation in Uruguay, which it was a energy po a policy that was presented with like four strategic axes. This axis were like the um, matrix, but also was coming from the promotion of the energy efficiency and the access to energy in terms of um, accessibility, affordability, and the entire population. I'm sorry, someone has their mic, maybe it's Matthew. There you go, thank you. So as I was mentioning, this policy of um, Uruguay energy policy that started in 2008, it has four strategic axes. And within that, well, it uh, combined the diversification of the energy matrix, the startup, the promotion of energy efficiency, and also ensure the condition of access and uh, security of energy in the entire country, um, especially touching uh, the lower income population. So somehow this policy has this view of sustainable development of the country in terms of energy. So a very important milestone happened in 2010, which this policy was approved by a multi-party um, commission that was represented by all the policy uh, parties that has had some representation in the parliament. And this was very important for us because this turned into a, a state policy 
and looking for all the energy bets in the long run that are so important in this terms. So right now we're 10, 50 years ago from this uh, policy and we can see the accomplishment, the goals, the results, the results that you say Uruguay has been acknowledged by the high um, renewable participation, uh, renewable energy participation in its matrix and with an electric matrix that by 2019, 2020 imp uh, went beyond the 20% of the renewable energies. It was a process that somehow was accelerated and successful because the metering corporation was in a short uh, term of 15 years in which we went from being an important uh, importer of electric uh, energy to be um, an exporter of electricity. And also in terms of the um, primary matrix, it re reduced from 60% of uh, fuel, uh, fuel oil uh, fuels energy, I'm sorry, to uh, renewable ones. And for us, it's uh, uh, fuel fossils are important. So it has a major impact in terms of um, economy and especially sovereign energy is sovereign. So some um, important milestones, some of the results that we see in terms of the offer of energy have moved forward. And also we have this axis of demand of energy and then we have this energy efficiency focus how this process of incorporating renewable energy at the large scale has walked along with uh, policies that promote energy efficiency for the final use of energy and this with two focuses one to optimize the investment the generation that the country has to make all this energy that has not been uh, used but we have, don't have to generate it so that's the best a scenario and then also is considering from the uh, user standpoint what we point is to have an improvement of the competitivity of the economic sectors a reduction of the energy use and the families and to look first to find watch which energy efficiency opportunities we have and then to analyze how we can move forward to substitute the use of fossil fuels in the final users. So right there in energy efficiency, one of the main uh, milestones that also has to allow the continuity of the implementation of these policies was in 2009, the uh, approval of the energy efficiency use of electricity. This law declares the energy efficiency uh, use of energy uh, for the national security. And while it went beyond the classic definition of energy efficiency, we consider that all the projects that incorporate the renewable energies to substitute the final use of fossil fuels or even um, and greed energy, it's also considered energy efficiency projects. And that is something really particular in its time when it happened, it was something uh, innovative and it looks for this synergy between renewable energies and energy efficiency in general terms. Another important thing about this act established a commitment from the executive power to elaborate this energy efficiency plan to establish some goals to accomplish year by year during the period of the plan. And also uh, complementary, it creates this trust and this allows us to have an annual budget that we can implement to promote energy efficiency policies year after year in the country. So this is a major strength that allows us to have some sustainability for um, energy efficiency, which sometimes are hard to uh, demonstrate the effects and to promote them. It's easier just to say open um, um, generating uh, energy plant, not showing how much energy is not being used due to energy efficiency. So that, yeah, a report and all the work that Brazil is doing of assessment of their plan is super important to um, contribute to all of us to move forward in the quantification of these savings that sometimes it's so hard to, to get. As of today, we we'll believe that we are in the new uh, stage of energy transition. We have this um, electric uh, matrix, which is renewable. And the challenge that we have before us is to move forward in the decarbonization of the final use of energy. Right there, the major bet is to go into the electrification of the transportation sector, which it totally makes sense in this framework of renewable elect electric energy. 
and also the development of uh, green energy in the country. As I was saying, well, for fossil fuels are imported in Uruguay, and the transportation sector is 74% of the demand of fuels in the country. That's why every effort that could be made in there is quite relevant in terms of the climate change commitments. And that's why we have with a number of instruments for, specific for the sector. And nevertheless, we're aware that the electrification of uh, transportation in Uruguay will take some time because the entire uh, fleet, it's quite complex. So it's still we promote the more classic efficiency, energy efficiency um, strategies like the uh, most recent approvals that will allow us that all the uh, fuel energy um, vehicles will be more efficiency than the means of the marketplace. And then we will move forward on that more traditional means combined with new bets. Thank you very much, Carolina. So interesting. Really, it's very interesting. Everything that you are doing. And right there, it's this part that the energy that is not being used, well, you don't have to generate it. And a very relevant uh, topic that Carmen also mentioned. And now these are investments. You optimize some investments that you don't have to use in the uh, short term. And these are investments like smarter, well planned to how to improve your electric system. And in this electrification of the uh, transportation system, well, I believe that Latin America, there's uh, several labs and uh, therefore there will be a number of experiences that we can share among ourselves because Chile is really um, advanced in this topic. Colombia, the same, Mexico already started. So I believe that we have a lot of material right now that our uh, boss, Brian, is listening. We have a lot of material for more reports even and that we can share. Thank you very much, Cano. Now we'll go to Jose Antonio. Jose Antonio Arteaga is always here with us and we're so honored for, to have you here, Jose Antonio, the Inter-American Development Bank. It has a major experience, not just in energy topics, but also energy efficiency topics. And one of the main aspects that, that it was uh, mentioning in its presentation was the creation of jobs, uh, the jobs from today and the future ones. So in terms of jobs, as we saw this at the report, the Inter-American Development Bank, IDB, um, made this report about jobs in the electric sector in Latin America. So this information is quite relevant because uh, there's some jobs by gender, by women, the profile of the uh, position jobs in the future, as well as the level of professionalization that is currently available and also the one that will be needed. So Jose Antonio, if you could please share a bit more about how to rethink about the energy efficiency in this process of emerging sectors that Carolina and Carmen mentioned, they both. Thank you very much. Uh, quite a privilege to be able to join with the International Energy Agency. And well, first to congratulate and to thank for this report, promoting energy efficiency and contributing to accessibility and affordability of jobs. I believe that it's a great report and actually one of the major contributions of energy efficiency and, and the entire thing like um, emerging industry like renewable energies, energy efficiency, green hydrogen, electromobility. It's very relevant. So in this study, it's highlighted that every million dollars at the international level, because we first gather the information internationally and then through service that are um, applied to um, associations and businesses that inter related to uh, all these topics, energy efficiency in Bolivia, Chile and Uruguay, we have something more specific of these three countries and that reflects somehow what is happening in Latin America. But the, this report, the most relevant thing is the that every million dollars we generate about 30, 36 uh, jobs in clean energies in these uh, countries, emerging countries. I remember last uh, weeks there was this panel in Mexico with Andrew McLean, 
which is the Commission Aid of Green Energy in California and the U.S. And he was saying that the ESCOs, uh, energy service companies, ESCOs, um, that have this, uh, they offer these services, it's about the same volume of business that the distributor uh, companies in California, that in total, these ESCOs employ 43,000 people. So this provides an idea of the size now we're talking that an industry that uh, is related to energy efficiency represents about the same business that the distributing companies in Canada um, in the reports um, is highlighted in just 2018. It was generated um, 46,000 employees in the US for every million dollars. We were generated 20 jobs. It's another very important that uh, strengths. It's not just isolated statistics. There's this systematic analysis in different parts of the world that brings us to this kind of conclusions. Now it's important to mention that for Latin America, Bolivia, Chile, Uruguay, in total, I will also mention this when inclusion in total of 27% of the jobs are um, in charge of women in Argentina is 23%. And in this emerging industry through these three countries it's about 14%. And well, specifically in energy efficiency, the average for these three countries, 26% of the uh, labor force is our women. The most, uh, the largest, uh, cases Bolivia with 56% of women, in Chile 16% in Uruguay 35%. So this gives us an idea that it's not just jobs, but also a gender inclusion that it's uh, a really relevant topic as well. Uh, also, I would like to highlight that in general, for the average level, for every million dollars in the rest three countries, uh, six jobs are generated in create generation and other six in emerging um, industry. I mean, this increased the number of jobs, the generation, and, and, and I insist, this is the result of the direct survey with um, this uh, very well elaborated questionnaire with all this systematized information. And this gives a clear information of how this has been improving the energy emerging of the energy efficiency and energy created from the generation of energy. And I believe that this is quite encouraging. And we're working very closely with the IDB. We um, to des design some schemes for the creation or training of human resources, because we also found the need of professionalize those people that are pretend to um, add to this field of um, emerging industry. So it's important we're working with um, superior um, institutions, superior education institution, and what we expect to have uh, the development of some curriculum for uh, higher levels of education. And of course, there has been some improvements, but still need to reinforce this sector. And uh, something very relevant that I would like to highlight that I did was mentioning some of the major topics is the co benefits that are not um, clearly mentioned in the report, but it's very, they're very relevant. Uh, before the panel started, I was mentioning that right now, I'm in La Paz, Bolivia, in the preparation of this energy efficiency for um, public lighting. And so the agency, it's uh, shown how in the case of Mexico, uh, LED uh, lighting was like, went from being 3% in 2012 to be 62% in 2021 and what other kind of benefits the uh, public lighting has. Well, in some studies performed by the bank itself, for instance, in the case of Chile, the, in the implementation and in summertime, when we have two hours more of natural light, it has been reduced the um, felons, uh, felonies in 20%. In the case of Mexico, according to uh, some municipality section, the lighting the improvements in lighting have reduced seven percent of uh, grave, uh, major felonies and uh, even 50 percent of uh, burglaries so they concur that when you use led uh, lights that increase uh, the lighting uh, criminality has reduced uh, 30 percent so that's an idea of the co benefits another idea that also strength the energy efficiency projects it was mentioned by the um, public lighting is that there's this survey that applies in Mexico with the 
um, statistic industry uh, institute and one of the major problems that the citizens face the problems of what they complain the most in mexico a population over 20 uh, 18 percent are holes on the um on the the road and 62 percent complain about the uh, lighting i mean we have some major uh, areas of opportunity and still a lot to contribute so thank you very much for this opportunity of participate in this webinar Thank you very much, Jose Antonio. You actually bring a number of uh, topics, how they're all uh, interconnected, because we're talking about replacing programs of te inefficient technologies, and then we end up talking about the reduction of um, burglaries, how people feel more safe. And that's actually what we want to bring in here, uh, to be able to provide more information, not just in Latin America, of course, but that this uh, multiple benefits are seen in the energy efficiency of working on that. Thank you very much, Jose Antonio. Well, I will go back. I will give a, bit, a small um, round for the three of you. And Carmen, I would like to go back to this topic of uh, PE. I mean, it's so interesting, this approach of this program that a lot of these resources that you have already mentioned over $320 million are um, addressed to low-income houses for energy efficiency. I mean, which are the main reasons that um, motivate this kind of programs, incentivate this kind of programs that go into that sector, which have been like the main benefits that you have gotten in this uh, sector, in the households. If you could please share somehow uh, you know, we, we have a lot to say, but please make it brief if you could assist us with that. Carmen, please. Yes, uh, if I sensitize, I would like just to destroy something there. $320 million per year. These are the energy efficiency program applications. I mean, there's a different typologies there's different profiles of low income is one of the profiles but there are others like residential educational uh, commerce industry public buildings that's a uh, public service of course but um low income users are the major beneficiaries of energy efficiency pe this energy efficient program the efficiency the low income programs well we try to reduce the um the use of energy and to increase the energy efficiency in the low income uh, households and well this includes the users with uh, preferred rates and the country use the social rates which is like a, a residential rate with some reduction and also the pe involves residents or the uh, users that are based in some communities of low income so we have uh, residential users of low income which are benefit but also communities that were taken care of like uh, philanthropic associations in uh, neighborhoods some daycare centers hospitals which are located in these low income communities usually they have they struggle in their pay of their bills of energy. So we have these programs like access, the uh, stealing of energy that also, uh, well, to reduce these measurements of energy, they, this topic of uh, criminality, I mean, uh, the, to, to take care of the use and, and to take care of this uh, outdated equipment which is a reality that these low-income uh, users experience on an everyday basis. And while this low-income it's um, uh, supports are based on the law uh, provided by PE and the applications afterwards. So starting in 2005, the uh, law established that it was a minimum uh, allocation for these resources for low-income. In 2005, there was the destination of 50% of the total resources for PE for low income. And we have some changes along the time in 2010, this increased to 60% this allocation. And even in 2015, 
it was established the obligatoriety of 60% uh, to be able to reach up to 80% in 2016. It was established the minimum obligation and there was this uh, two top uh, limit of uh, 80% to also being able to benefit other kinds of consumers and a long time we also see that there's the regional diversity which is major because uh, the country is so big so the program it has been very capitalized that established all 63 uh, electric energy distributor companies in the country so there's some regions with a lot of need and demand of those actions but there are other places and municipalities even states where the social topic is not that urgent and the uh, mandatory legally mandatory aspect wasn't being taken care of because there was not that profile of use so out of 2016 the act establishes these demands but the uh, re um, regulations of an l established some governance minimum governance regulations that continue to benefit all these uh, users one of the regulations that is still in force establishes that at least 50 percent of the investments of the pe has to be allocated to two kinds of use with more participation of the energy um, market the distributors have one of the classes which are like the residential users and this includes the low income uh, forcing and ensuring that those users will have some resources for investments of energy efficiency another part of the uh, regulation that distributors have some autonomy for the application and for 60 the remaining 60 percent and it verifies some of the distributors that take care of the region where some of the they have um allocated the, the, those resources for that those kind of funding so we are benefiting both the distributors that are looking to solve some commercial problems like a stealing theft no payment and also to benefit the users with some actions of energy efficiency that in general is or the substitution of lamps uh, refrigerators acs and also educating um, actions participation awareness and looking for the energy efficiency associations in the rechange of the devices represents as well some of the changes for this um, users to to increase an awareness to promote the good results and this has been happening from 2018 to 2020 and the reduction of use has been one of the typologies that have received the most of the funds um, and we do have this evidence in the monitoring that we uh, perform and also some other studies that we're mentioning that are in motion on the kind of impact so one implementation will allow to have like a more plausible cost and also we can analyze how they can um, have in the future to see what's the performance of the public policies of the PE, which is a mechanism of uh, election of the kind of projects and to analyze how the distributors define and which are the typologies. So we are in this analysis stage. So we can say that this is a combination of the regulations of governance that promote the benefit of like a more representative of the Brazilian society, as well as some other uh, sector programs or even local ones. And then this related topics to businesses of the energy distributor uh, companies that are allocated to the attention of their subscribers and trying to keep a, a 
income level of those consumers. So in a PE, we see like a solution. We have a, a benefit of the energy in the marketplace and also uh, increasing the marketplace, the energy market. So that was it. Thank you very much, Carmen. Well, every time you uh, make us to be more uh, anxious to look for this report in this two tickets of implementation. My dear Carolina, if you could also, I would be able to ask you, during you, um, this presentation, she mentioned uh, this public uh, lighting program that was uh, promoted like in two different stages and that was giving that you came to uh, is saving an important percentage of the energy use. And as I understand, the coverage was up to 80% of the household, 70 something, over 70%. So I would like to, if you could please um, let me know what, what were like the incentives to promote this program in the saving speak by themselves, but before um, implementing it, the savings were not sure. So I don't know if you would like to share some information because I, we know that before uh, it was implemented, maybe you can share some of these incentives that boost this program. Well, first of all, I would like to uh, give a little bit of context, this plan. This was this plan of um, changing of luminaires in, um, at the level of households. It was the first edition in 20, uh, 20, 2008. That back then, was I was mentioning, we're in this stage where we were defining the energy um, policies. And all these years, without major um, investment, so the energy sector was very stressed. And also, we noticed that it was a moment of uh, drought, so we didn't have much hydraulic power. So that's why we're in this moment of energy crisis in which we even have to go for saving plans in public uh, institutions, in uh, shopping centers, even incentivating the population, the reduction of um, use with this saving um, approach to avoid some shortages, outages. So um, thank God we didn't have to really apply these outages with all these saving plans that were implemented. So with this context, it was that in 2008, we implemented from UTE, the uh, state company, the implementation of the rechange of lamps. Back then it was to uh, give two compact fluorescent lamps by household uh, such that the uh, users would give two incandescent bulbs. So it was back then when the um, technology was emerging, it was new, the population was not aware of that. So that was the scheme that was implemented. And yes, as it was mentioning, results were great. About 75% of the households made this change for these lamps that uh, was promoting and it estimated that that reduction of the demand of energy at the level of the households and the country and also the impact about the reduction of the uh, demand peak i mean those were the assessments that were made in its time to implement the plan then in 2011 2012 there was a new addition after five years where the first delivery of this rechange of lamps, it was estimated that these lamps were um, ending their useful uh, life shelf. So we had a, a delivery plan. It was not a rechange. I mean, if I don't have an incandescent bulb at home because it was the low um, technologies uh, that were permeated in the marketplace, we didn't go, want to go to the user would go and buy a new lamp but with that's why we gave up and it was a really high rate of acquisitions of these uh, saving lamps i believe that it's also important that the plan the co-benefits cool of the energy efficiency back then in 2012 with the new technologies in the marketplace also helped us to sensitize make sensitive 
uh, this population. It was a national campaign where it was making more sensitive the awareness of the technology, their use, and in parallel from the ministry, we're also working in the technical standardization and the labeling of low um, use. So it was like everything rounded up like the context in which it was given, it was not positive. So all this concurred. And well, it was something that we have been promoting this kind of analysis of cost and benefit related to the different instruments of energy efficiency that we defined uh, and promoted. And as I said this year, it was approved the regulation of the labeling of uh, light vehicles this uh, public consultancy of uh, uh, labeling of lead lamps and in both cases it was made gathering information from the marketplace the importers some of the devices that are imported in uruguay and well making the assessment of which will be their impact in the marketplace at the level of the price of the technologies and the impact of the reduction of the use both at the level of final use and the country. I believe that that's a really good practice that help us to uh, support the policies that we're implementing. And well, we, we're clear that we don't do this just for the labelings, but also for other programs for energy efficiency support, in which we're trying always to have a counterpart from the user to own the project that we're implementing, the benefits that they're, it's producing, and that way also to make more dynamic the public investment, as Jose was mentioning, and then to promote the marketplace related to these topics. Of course. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carolina. And it was mostly like in this crisis moments when it also um, promotes us to think in a different manner, like outside of the box. And it's regrettable that only then it's when we do it. But well, we move forward. I also would like to remind the audience, we will make, we will ask one more question to uh, Antonia, and then we can go to a Q and A brief session. Unfortunately, time is about to run out, but if you would like to start uh, asking your questions on the chat, please write them down. And then I will go to this question to Jose Antonio. So I believe Jose Antonio that we're talking of a number of topics right here, but in your interventions, we're about to uh, closing all this mixture, but one topic that for sure the agency and with the commissions that we have created, it's this part that these trans energy transitions are centered on the people. In this case, energy efficient only would be for a specific sector, but for everyone and when and no one left out. So we believe that we have all this experience in these programs of rechange of uh, devices or inefficient devices and not the program by itself because we can learn about the formula but it's how do we do such that the energy efficiency programs what they do is to provide a growth and comfort uh, experience because actually we have this program that change this um, devices that are inefficient to have a program that the device is not more expensive if do even make it more inexpensive then we have more access and even more modernization in our households to increase comfort and savings well to know that you have a major experience in mexico so what is it that we should not live um, be, uh, on, on the side to take a benefit of all these social benefits to use all this, I mean, to use all these um, reads and all that. I mean, what kind of advice? Well, thank you. I believe that the interventions fundamentally in energy efficiency are justified to understand the, what is missing in the marketplace. So the intention is to transform uh, the market for the devices and to have these more uh, efficient devices. It's sufficient. I mean, it's not enough, as Carmen said, but it comes along with awareness with a consciousness of these um, devices. So the awareness is relevant. So how do we make that the standardization of the devices will turn into the purchase of these devices because more efficient um, devices initially have a more expensive cost. So the two major things is the mo mo uh, major program 
it was not for the residential, but the industrial sector at the end of the 90s. It was a program to incentivize the sailings of um, high efficiency electric engines. At the, as before um, the, the initial, less than 3% was high efficiency. There was this vicious circle. The companies did not purchase them because they were not offered their services. And the manufacturers and distributors would not sell them because no one was demanding them. So from alone with a bank, there was this program when they incentivated, there was this discount and the purchase of the, the equipment. And after a few years, 100% of the device equipment was high efficiency in Mexico. And to go back to, it was established the standard for high efficiency in engines. A very clear example, it went the other way around. It came in, um, in, in effect, this regulation to stop using uh, incandescent bulbs to use more efficient um, bulbs. And back then it was compact fluorescent lamps. The difference in the price from the incandescent with a, floor, a compact fluorescent in, in a large marketplace, it was four times. So the low income population was unable to really make that change. So what we did was this program, what it was delivered for free, 83 million lamps. This was a really great business for the um, government because the recovery was with a reduction of the subsidy. And a third pro uh, program was the station of electrodomestic devices like air, air conditioning. And what was established back then was this program that allowed to give this funding to the families that didn't have um, commercial funding. And when they had it, it was in this condition that was a really extreme to call it the least. So we have this um, created this liquid warranty and credit lines to um, take care of what uh, the user would not be paying. And also the electric billing was used for the charging of the device. And this saving allowed to pay for the funding. And with this was allowed, um, accomplished that low income families was able to have access to new equipment. So these programs would allow is to increase uh, the uh, more um, efficient programs and in high scale, this turns into a reduced price. So even though the use of the households had increased in a very important manner, the electric bill you know, as an average and the energy uh, use has reduced because now they have access to more efficient devices, to more adequate uh, prices. So this is the phenomenon that creates. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose Antonio. Well, we have been um, over twice the report, so we're really moving forward and more and more information. I really thank the three of you. If I can abuse, um, I have a few questions from the audience. I would like to ask them. They're not addressed to anyone in particular. So if any of you three would like to mention, please go ahead. And in here, there's a very interesting question because it's something that do you believe that when we have an electricity rate, which is lower for low income um, households, could this incentivate to a higher use of energy? This would not be like a two a blade sword. Someone would like to mention about this. Well, can I comment, Anna? Yes, of course, can and please. So I would like to thank to this question because I believe that this is something very rational with the comment that I made. Um, some of the low income users in our program, I would like to make clear how that social rate uh, in a quick manner was established. I mean, this rate, it's something that benefits the low in, uh, income users. This social rate, which is called as um, I mean, it was established by this uh, institution, by this law uh, starting in 2012, that provides some discount to low income users to classify as low income. It's needing to meet some requirements like um, a registry of the user uh, in a, to measure I mean, so this low income uh, fee is part of this uh, social strategies from the Brazilian government that includes not just the energy, but another 
social programs like education, uh, some supports, uh, some income supports that are related with this um, registry national. And some plans have ongoing uh, social assistance. But uh, the social rate in, in Brazil is made such that there is no that incentive to the use. It's a rate with regressive um, with regressive support. So if the um, if the use increases, then the support is reduced to avoid this unwanted situation of an excessive use of energy. But well, a lot more information could be provided in the national energy use uh, for rates in Brazil, okay? Thank you very much, Carmen. Now, Jose Antonio would like to add something. I believe that he, uh, it's very clear in uh, the report that about 9% of the income in Latin America of the are addressed to the payment of their uh, energy and in the poor it's 24 so there has to be some policies that promote a more accessibility to the services that we have for electric services but i believe that the formula is not reducing um, the rates but it's more like with energy efficiency measurements it's the more effective way to use it and the most cost effective to mitigate climate change among the many benefits that we have mentioned here thank you Jose antonio caro carolina well uh, if i would add uh, in the case of uruguay there has been some commercial discount programs for low-income households in which what it's uh, trying to look is to get some uh, conditions for them to acquire some security and to regulate electric uh, sector, promoting the regularization of the use. And then it, this is a strategy that looks, that supplements a number of things. Some of the uh, commercial discounts with this logic of increasing um, fares, trying to look for uh, appropriate uses, but also to bring this along with a more efficient technologies and also uh, making more sensitive how the energy is used at the household, which is another key element to promote, to ensure any efficient use and that they can face the, their rate at the end of the month. Well, thank you. Another question. This is more like specific for Brian, for the agency. In the energy efficient topics, which are the following topics with social aspects? I don't know if you would like to give a brief comment on this, Brian. Thank you. Anna, Anna, excuse me. Thank you very much, Anna, and thanks. It's been great to listen to all of the interventions here. Really interesting. As I said, I think there's a lot of new research coming out all the time. We've heard of much of it today and new reporting and new data about exactly how energy efficiency programs are supporting all of uh, these people in various ways in terms of making energy more affordable, making people's lives more comfortable, promoting job creation. So we plan to continue to collect this data, but we particularly want to put a focus on not just showing the benefits, but but helping governments understand what are the design uh, features that will help the policies maximize these benefits and also maximize the good distribution of these benefits. So we're hoping that today is part of a conversation where we can learn from these wonderful stories we're hearing about how governments can factor in maximizing the benefits for the people who need it most into their design of future energy efficiency policies. And that's something we plan to continue. And I should mention as well, it's going to be a major part of the discussion at our upcoming global conference on energy efficiency which is taking place in france on the 7th and 8th of june so colleagues can find more information about that conference on our website and we will be discussing that topic in more detail then thank you anna thank you very much brian i believe that time is run out so i would like just to finish if maybe we can uh, conclude this amazing 
and very tasty panel that we have had today with just one word that could be relevant for each of you, which would be the most relevant message of today that you would like to give to the audience, one or two words, if each of you could please help us. Carmen, could you please start with you? Yes, we can. Well, I would like to say that maybe one or two words would be affordability to to provide access to everyone and depending on their capacities and with governability. So I believe that that would be it. Thank you very much, Carmen. Carolina? Maybe it could be opportunities, right? I mean, how energy efficiency allows us to generate a number of opportunities in terms of accessibility, but also about sustainable development in general terms and job creation. I mean, all the co-benefits cool that are related to energy efficiency and how to convert this into opportunities, the challenges that we have before us. Yes, opportunities. Thank you. I'll, Jose Antonio. Results. I believe that it's quite clear how the results of this agency it has been shown some results and how these results are convenient, how we can go from good intentions to good investments and even better results. I really good. Good intentions and better investments. Well, thank you very much to everyone. Indeed, I will give the floor to you to give the last messages. There were some questions if we would record the session, but I will leave at it. I really thank three of you, Carmen, Carolina, Jose Antonio, Brian and Edith, and all the audience that have been with us. Edith, I'll give the floor back to you. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Anna, and thanks to everybody who stuck around. I see we still have almost everybody here despite having gone over time. Um, I think that the, the concluding words, um, access, opportunities, results are, are really good words to leave us with. And I would just add that this report is not meant to be the end. There was a process going into the report, a lot of dialogue, and we'd like this to continue. So as Brian said, we're continuing to work on these issues and we're continuing to work in the region, particularly as we build up to the publication of this special report. So so um, we, we will be in touch and uh, just to say thank you to everyone for your comments, for your participation, to our speakers um, and wishing you a very nice rest of your day. Thank you.